a July morning in a fjord in Greenland. We are with Hitu, a former fisherman who has transitioned to adventure tourism. We're approaching Kapisili. Is it difficult to pronounce? Everything is difficult to pronounce. It is a tiny village with 42 inhabitants. It's truly remote at the end of a fjord, a two to two and a half hour boat ride from Nuuk, the capital of Greenland. We're going to spend a few days. It's honestly an extraordinary place. You get the impression that life nature, nothing has changed here for millennia. And to start our journey as globe fishermen, I couldn't have asked for anything better. It's as if we were inside a large bowl filled with ice cubes. It's quite astonishing. Surrounded by mountains everywhere. Here, we're at the edge of the world, it feels like a dream, there are icebergs, they are first icebergs and then, all I want to do is to see the icebergs, the ice cubes, which are perhaps 10 meters high. It's extraordinary, to be honest. The further one goes into the fjord, the more ice cubes and small icebergs increase. And the navigation is going to become increasingly challenging. Hitu asked Christian, who is also accompanying us to Capacillit, to be his co-pilot. Some of the ice is just the transparent. You can't see it. And if you sail with 20 knots or more into it, we navigate among millions of ice cubes that are quite identifiable, and just now, he told us, be careful, they're not always visible, it's better not to hit one. It's 10% above the surface and 90% below. We can barely talk to them. We maneuver through them on the right and left. It's funny. Despite the danger, there's an incredible good mood. They keep laughing, they're very concentrated, but they don't stop joking around. Will sing a song for us. I only have eyes for you. <laughs> the song is... What are you doing, Christian? We we are trying to pick up some ice. Why? Uh, two hour drinks. <laughs> but the first one to collect ice is Pia Marie, Pitu's wife. Pure ice. This is pure ice. Yes, it's the best quality. Eh? Yeah, it's the best for drinks. <laughs> it's about the purest water in the world. A few thousand years. I think it's more than 200,000 years old. 200,000. Yeah. This is Greenlandic vodka. <laughs> this is Greenlandic. Ah, this is special Greenlandic vodka. Yes. Yes. Of course. Yes. yes. And with the local ice. Yeah, it's made from the water. Is it here. like a treasure? Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's something quite funny. We left Nuke 2, maybe two and a half hours ago. It was very cold, barely five degrees. And now, it's unbelievable, it must be 15 or 18 degrees. It's a different world. Pascal, good one? Yes, merci. A votre santé. A votre santé, chin, chin. Chin, chin. Kasutsa, tomato. It's delicious. Iceberg. You're welcome. Wow. 
<laughs> it's got a bit of a local flavor. After toasting with our new Greenlandic friends, it's time to continue our journey. Are we all right now? Two, five minutes. To the paradise. The secret paradise. We tend to believe that paradise is in blue lagoons with palm trees, but it exists here too. And on top of that, the atmosphere is just as good. This is a camp, Asimut camp. Welcome. Welcome to Asimut camp. Asimut camp. At the end of the fjord lies four wooden cabins that it took built itself. It welcomes lovers of wild nature, hikers, and fishermen. We're heading towards the cabin that Hitu has reserved for us. First impression, a true sense of the end of the world and an absolutely unique setting. Is it sporty? Yes, but if it's to arrive there, I'm willing to make all the efforts in the world. Well, it's five-star luxury for us. Honestly, we're used to cabins that are a bit rustic, a bit basic, but this. <laughs> On the other side of the bay, the small fishing village of Capacillan. But before we go visit it, we prefer to gear up and go fishing. The first surprise awaits us on the way. Look at that one. Porcini mushrooms that are also called Arctic folies. Here, they're all edible. The culinary journey starts with porcini mushrooms. We didn't catch any fish, but we already have porcini mushrooms. We've already found the side dish. Now let's go fishing for the main course. After a 45-minute hike, we reach the famous Seven Lakes Trail. Freshwater lakes connected by wide and tumultuous streams. The flies are with us, a good sign of the presence of salmonids. We start with this spoon lure in the calmest part of the river. I've made it. Great. How's it going? Not a single bite. It's not catch and go. No, but you know, well, that's fishing for you. We often start off, um. Not great. Exactly. But there comes a moment when it takes off. Anyway, I can't wait for it to take off. I'm going to move a bit further. Once again, the river flows into the lake, and I'm going to try my luck over there. They don't want to bite. Yes! I've got one. I have caught my first salmon in this tumultuous river. We jiggle with a size three spoon lure and entice them. And then I had the complete impression of having caught a rock because it was, um, I had the impression that wasn't moving. It was powerful. I got it. I'm going to meet Bertrand, 
Can't wait to show it to him. Hope he got one too. How did you do it? Stunning. Look. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Is that an Arctic? Is it? Yes, a very beautiful Arctic. Between the well rocks, done. as soon as it slowed down a bit in the resting areas, I cast it and I got one. Greenland's first fish. Pascal found the spot. A deep pool of water behind a small waterfall. That's where the Arctic char take a break before heading upstream to spawn. But they don't seem willing to bite anymore. So, we try elsewhere. Already half a day of fishing, only one fish. Just before leaving, Pascal catches his second one, but it came at a cost. I just caught another one, in that hole over there. But I might have broken something in the process. My fishing rod just broke. The second one, we've been struggling with Bertrand for three hours. It's been a very tough day. I lost a landing net. I just broke my fishing rod. We both lost maybe five or six spoons. It's difficult to continue fishing to be honest. For now. It's a stunning place. But the fish are not quite cooperating. Perhaps our expectations were too high. We were fantasizing too much. We were told there would be fish, but I don't know. There might be some, but they're not biting much. It's the first day. Sometimes it's just not your day. So we must not fall into despair and we must keep on trying. And we'll obviously get there. Put your spoon lure down, it will flutter on its own. Usually, they hide in the corners. Here and there. Bertrand decides to make a few casts. The last ones of the day, just in case. They didn't yield anything. Finished for today. A little disappointment, but it's short-lived, because tonight, here's the menu. It's not bad. What do you think? Greenland porcini mushrooms. Two sublime arctic char. Not bad for first day, wouldn't you say? Isn't it great? Summer nights are short in Greenland. Barely a few hours. We are intrigued by the small village of Kapisili. It is just 7 a.m. in the morning. We decide to go and have a look around. There are about 30 traditional wooden houses. In summer, the population rises to 70 inhabitants. We ended up not seeing anyone this morning. However, we have other plans. That's it. Are you all ready? Yes, that's it. We took our time for once. We have prepared well. We are ready. We're going to hike the Seven Lakes Trail where, reportedly, there is an endemic salmon. Hitu told us that there is a spot. We'll go up the river, and just as we reach the lake, that's where the fish are. Of course, it's not an exact measurement. He told us all about it with uncertainty. Well, we'll see. The last of the seven lakes, here it is just before the river flows into the fjord. It's here, a few meters between the river and the lake, where the water seems quieter than it would be possible to catch the famous endemic salmon. We are not alone this morning. The village children who know the area have been fishing for a good hour, but they haven't caught anything yet, and our first casts are also yielding no results. Minutes pass. Long minutes. When suddenly,
I just caught a salmon. Sublime. What beauty. It's a marvel. Congratulations. A native salmon from here. It's a unique species. That's a salmon. With a black lure. Incredible. Just goes to show anything can happen. This salmon only swims up this river, and there's a spot. We've tried several times before. And now, it bit. The children next to us haven't caught anything. Sometimes we're a little luckier than others. It weighs two and a half kilograms, and it's a magnificent catch. However, it'll be the only catch today. It's heavy once you hold it. It's a great size. The ideal salmon. Tonight, it's a feast at the cabin. It starts with this arctic char caught the day before, raw, marinated. A simple preparation with olive oil, lemon, and chives. Naturally, it has a different taste here. But the flavor is already exceptional. It is the same preparation, as usual. So, chives, salt, pepper, a bit of lemon. But, I don't know, it has a different taste than other arctic char. There's something astonishing too, the color of the flesh, a silky pink, I've rarely seen such a color. We're in a fjord, here, it's seawater. And right next to it, there's a freshwater waterfall, and the fish swims between the two. It's a blend of both the sea and the river that we find in this taste. Tonight, we're hosting our friends for dinner. We still have one arctic char the beautiful salmon from today, and a handful of porcini mushrooms that we'll share. Wow, and you pick some, uh, it's beautiful. This young guy here, it's the only river where the salmon are coming up and put their eggs in, in, in the lakes. All, it, all in, in Greenland? In all Greenland, it's the only river. It's a special one. And you can see the, the uh, this one is very healthy. It's very red. It's a healthy salmon. <laughs> this is 100% natural local salmon. We'll of course enjoy it with Christian and his wife Inga, who has just joined us. I'm okay. very happy. Oh, boy, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Something. <laughs> In Greenland, Kesuta. That's. Kesuta? Kesuta. Kesuta. Here's the simplest way, in foil. After it's cooked, but semi-cooked, of course, we'll add a bit of salt, pepper, olive oil, maybe some chives. While it's cooking, we let our guests taste the marinated arctic char. For Inga, who is of Inuit origin, it's a first. And I never get sherry uh, like this. You, you mean yeah, that your grandfather was a hunter? Ah, okay. And they they have a special place. Yeah. Her family have a special place yes. where where they cast the trouts, mm -hmm. and they stay on this place uh, for perhaps three weeks, four weeks, and they smoke. Ah, as well. Ah, they smoke the salmon. Okay, yes. Okay. yes. Right. So you you used to, to heat only smoked yes. salmon, yes. never like that. No, never capacity. Is it the never. first time? No, yes. tell me. It's this is the first time. This is the first time. Yes. It's incredible. Yes. We have a Greenlander who will eat carpaccio for the first time. What do you think? Mm. It's terrible, and uh, this melting in my mouth. Really? Yes. <laughs> so they say it's a different taste, like yes. smoked salmon. Yes, it's very really different. Voilà. 
I think that the cook mm, it smells it, so yes well. it smells so incredible it, so we're gonna take a little bit uh, olive oil yeah. now a little bit like that for a Frenchman it's a little bit <laughs> <laughs> and then if it's not enough you can do more yourself yeah. and then a little mm. bit uh, cibouette hmm? Ajouter un peu de ciboulette. Voilà. Je crois que... I believe that happiness is in the dish after all. It's perfect. It's just a bit raw inside. You know, it's a middle cook. It's so big that it could feed eight people. And Pascal will take up the skeleton and eat from <laughs> from the bones. Okay. Uh, it's very good. It's the best salmon I've ever eaten. And it's true that it's better than Arctic char or trout. Let's continue with local produce. The mushrooms that were picked this morning by you and I. The next day, a new fishing adventure awaits us in the fjord. We're doing a special kind of fishing, cod fishing. Obviously, it's in a very short space of time, it's really close. It's very close, just a hundred meters from the shore. Cod, or Atlantic cod, was on the brink of extinction due to industrial overfishing. It has made a comeback in large numbers. It's not a technique. Okay, it's, it's what? Just go to the bottom. Five, four, three, two, one. Now. Really? Yeah. You ready? <laughs> it's a joke. Ah, I took it too fast. Sorry. Now it's you like the it? wind. It's a technique of great simplicity. Apparently, the simplest techniques are not necessarily the easiest to execute. It's Bertrand's turn. And a few seconds later, he hooks another fish. I mustn't break the line. Take it easy. But this one won't get away. Oh wow, your first cod. Bertrand's first cod. The first cod of Greenland. That's great. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Itu. Yeah. You have succeeded. It's because of you. Let's let's try one more. Yeah. Tiens, Pascal, okay. one more pour toi. Ah. Did you get ah, one? Yes, I got one. But this is crazy. This one's heavy. Great. Wonderful. My first cod. It's a minute fish here. You catch it in less than five minutes. We got enough. We fish responsibly here. So, we'll stop. One fish each will be enough for this morning. We return to the camp to clean the cod. And we'll take this opportunity to rediscover forgotten flavors. What did you find? Show me. This right here is the famous cod liver. The cod liver they used to make us eat when we were children. And we used to hate it. We hated it. But now, I don't hate it at all. You're eating it raw? It's delicious. You serious? It's great. 
It does taste like cod liver, but much better. With eyes closed, you'd say cod liver, but it's good. After spending three days in Capacillit, it's time for us to head back to the capital altogether. While on the way back to Nuuk, we're going to partake in some more special fishing, and this time it'll be red fish. We're descending the fjord towards the south. After spending an hour on the road, the two stops at the foot of this magnificent waterfall for red fish fishing. The red fish, how can we describe it? Because if we say red fish, it won't work. It's like the little red fish you win at fairgrounds. I don't think it's the same thing. The red fish supposedly has a uniquely flavored flesh. The red fish is a big deep sea fish. They use these fishing rods. The technique is the same as for cod. We go all the way down to the bottom. It's about 30 meters deep. I got one. <laughs> we have to work a little bit, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but it's not a red fish, it's a cod. I'll release it. They won't believe us. Releasing a fish like this. We've caught quite a few, I think. We don't want to overconsume. Remember to press the stomach. Okay. Stomach? Why? Because of. What he's explaining to us is that since we're releasing it and it comes from the depths, due to the pressure, we need to press on its stomach, otherwise, it will experience pressure imbalance and can burst when it goes back down. It's heavy. <laughs> yes, it's a beautiful fish. Bertrand also doesn't catch a red fish. <laughs> we release the cod one by one. The red fish won't be for today, but that's all right. Fishing in such a place, whether we catch something or not, was truly worth it. It's the end of the day, and we finally arrive in Nuuk, the capital of Greenland. Nuuk, with 18,000 inhabitants, traditional houses, modern buildings, and some imposing statues. In Nuuk, there's also a renowned restaurant. We meet Kisten Glack, who is responsible for grocery shopping for the restaurant every morning. We accompany her to the city's market. In fact, there are two markets. We start with the covered market. On the stall, there's whale meat. Greenland is one of the few countries that can consume it, but there are quotas to protect the species. We're being offered a taste. Is it good? Raw whale meat, is it good? Very good. It tastes like beef carpaccio. It has a slight iron taste, salty iron. The first salad. It's a fish head uh, how long? I think it's caught two or three days ago. What was the size of this one? About six meters long. Six meters long, okay. Uh, you can take it. 
The mink whale is one of the smallest whale species. They represent three quarters of the catches within a quota of 200 whales allowed to be caught each year. Now we head to the other market. Let's go to the second one, maybe there will be seal meat. It's even said that they sell walrus here. The interesting thing is that this restaurant truly operates with the catch of the day from fishing and hunting. So, based on what they find, based on what inspires them, they create the menu for lunch and dinner. There's nothing. This is what we call Kaplan. This famous little fish arrives on the shores of Greenland, mostly in the south, by the hundreds of thousands. It's a very short season, so we shouldn't miss it. And I've been told that it belongs to the salmonid family, like trout, salmon, and arctic char. There's some seal meat. It doesn't look very appealing, it's a bit butcher-like, but it could be interesting. They have come back in large numbers, and today there are no quotas for hunting here. It is a sign that they are truly present, and there is no shortage of resources. About 15 kilos? Yes, but she's going to take the whole bag for a restaurant. Soup. Soup? Yeah. Ah, you, you make uh, it in yeah. soup? soup? Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. This is a traditional With, dish here? Yeah. Yeah, traditional. With rice. Yeah, N not grilled. Not grilled. Not grilled. Yeah. In soup? In soup, potatoes, onion. Onions, yes. And rice, that's it. A delivery service, how convenient. She's not sure if she'll have seal meat, she'll buy it as soon as she sees it. It's a short supply chain here, with no overfishing or overconsumption since the population is. How many is it again? 50,000. 50,000 inhabitants in a country that's five times the size of France, so there's plenty to eat. While waiting to taste the famous evening menu, it is time for lunch, and we have planned a picnic by the fjord. Cod. This is the cod that we prepared. Caught by us. Where does this cod come from? Right here. Perfect. It's vacuum sealed. Caught yesterday and vacuum sealed yesterday. Boiled in fjord water, it's the best way to prepare cod. We add, just a touch, of our own. It's delicious. Is it really? I feel like it's not just flesh. I assure you, it's lobster meat. I swear, it tastes like lobster, with the flavor of lobster. A firm and delicate cod with the taste of lobster an environment of absolute purity. Today, we are not far from paradise. In the evening, we visit the famous restaurant, Kale Iliarak, and here is its chef, along with Kisten Glack, whom we accompanied to the market this morning. We're with the famous chef, who is right behind us. I believe, he has been voted the best chef in Greenland several times. 
What's interesting about this chef is that he highlights Greenlandic culture. What is your philosophy? You use local herbs. Huh? You use the local ingredients as much as possible. The evening menu consists of 100% local dishes prepared with the day's ingredients. What kind of meat is it? Lamb. Lamb. Donc ça c'est de l'agneau d'ici. Et ça? So, it's green or the green now. As always, this restaurant that reveals and reinvents Greenlandic cuisine is fully booked. Here is the famous Capelin. I have already eaten dried fish. Here, it's a whole dried fish. It's a bit strange, but I like it. It's not uninteresting. And this is dried whale. Dried whale liver. You like liver. You like the cod liver. So, how is it? Solid. It has a lot of flavor. And now, one of the emblematic dishes of Greenland. Raw whale skin, with its fat. You have to cut it with this small tool. What do you think? It's a bit like survival food. I'm not going to take a big piece. It doesn't really inspire me, but I'm curious, so here goes. I feel like I'm eating bone or cartilage. I can't even chew it. Whale fat. I love it. When I eat this, I feel like I could swim with them. Tomorrow. In the second part of our journey in Greenland, we land in Narsarswek and head to Ipiutek Farm, where there is reportedly an exceptional river. There is a French woman who opened a guest house there, and during the year, they also raise sheep. She fell in love with a, um... With a sheep? <laughs> with a Greenlander, and she settled with him in a remote fjord. At the same time, she has a fishing domain there that is said to be extraordinary. One of the best in Greenland. Even though we are now in the far south of Greenland, on the way, we still see icebergs. Some quite large. It's extraordinary. We just narrowly pass by. After an hour on the road, we arrive at our destination. Is this it, you attack? Yes, this is it. The whole family is here to pick us up. Hello, Agath. Ipiutak is a 10 hectare domain. It includes a farm, a large sheepfold with 250 sheep, a table d'hote, a few wooden chalets, and nothing else around. In the summer, there is a lot of work in the fields. In Callista, Agath's husband is on his tractor until nightfall. The Franco-Greenlandic family does everything themselves and settled here in 2007. It's already their 11th year in an environment that is not always hospitable. What are the main challenges? There are many, but the main one. I don't know, maybe it's the extreme isolation. In winter, we can go for several weeks, sometimes even months, without seeing anyone else but ourselves. It's an amazing change of life. I think that in westernized and urbanized countries, even in the countryside, it reminds us of our position in the natural world. We're just a small part of nature, and it's not us who decide. 
On her swing, Hina, Agath and Callista's daughter, a little girl who is not quite like others. What do you think of this life? I would say that it is very different from a normal life in the city. It is nice to be alone and have nature around me. It is also pleasant to be with animals. How is school going? My mother teaches me at home. Every morning throughout the winter. Is it because there are no classes in the summer? No, I'm on vacation. <laughs> Just like everyone else then. You told me that you have family in France. Do you get to see them often? Every two and a half years or so. I'm happy to be there, but I don't like staying too long. So, you want to come back here? Yes. The next morning, it's finally time to test this river that we've heard so much about. But, we don't know much about the fishing technique to use. Shall we try with a fly and a spoon, and then switch? Exactly. That's exactly what we're going to do. Apparently, it's an ideal river for fly fishing, but we also make sure to bring a spoon to ensure we reach our minimum fishing quota, which is five fish per person per day, no more. We've been wanting to come here, to Agath's place, for a long time. It seems that it's one of the most beautiful fishing spots in Greenland. We shouldn't get too excited, but we just can't help it. After a short hour of hiking, we discover the Ilua River. The river originates from the top of this mountain, flows into a beautiful fall, and then it continues for five kilometers, both calm and winding before flowing into the lake, which is connected to the fjord. It's magnificent. I didn't expect this. It feels like a lost valley. Totally. It's like being in Jurassic Park. I hope we don't see any dinosaurs. Polar bears have made their way here. They have wandered up to this place. It's absolutely majestic. It's like something out of the Lord of the Rings. In this end of the world setting, we come across the wreckage of an American fighter plane along the way. It crashed here during World War II. At that time, Greenland served as a base for the U.S. Air Force. But the place is inaccessible. 75 years later, no one has been able to retrieve the plane wreckage. Here is the river. I think I'll have an advantage with the fly. In any case, on this stretch of the river compared to you, we need to look for holes. We'll fish up the river, a good way to avoid being seen by the fish that are also swimming upstream to spawn. There are three or four fish swimming upstream. Magnificent, superb. When the water is clear like this, it's fantastic. That's great, but that doesn't mean I'll catch them. Yet, after a few minutes. Slowly. The first one from Ipiutak. Magnificent, sublime. Look at that salmon-colored coat, it's beautiful. It truly is an elegant fish. Look at it, it's not damaged at all. A truly sublime place. 
This really is one of the most beautiful places in Greenland. It's a chance to be in such a place, catching such amazing fish. And on top of that, with such flavorful flesh. Moments later, Pascal also catches one. I'm going to bring it in gently, tire it out a bit. It's quite pretty, it's putting up a fight. Yes, very pretty. Super pretty. A beautiful arctic char. It's a good size. We have a magnificent river here, there's something for everyone. A bit of spoon fishing, a bit of fly fishing. We've been on the river for about 15 minutes. Each of us has caught a nice arctic char. But it seems we've been spotted, and they're not fighting anymore. Bertrand then switches to using a streamer, a fly fishing technique where the fly is allowed to sink and drift silently. And indeed, it works. My first catch on the fly in this river. A purplish colored streamer. A beautiful arctic char, caught quickly, very voracious. You have to be quiet. You have to go very slowly. You almost have to crawl when you approach. You have to move quickly, and there you go. The first one here, the first on the fly. I just lost my first fly, the one I caught my first fish with. Nothing seems to be working anymore. The second fly is not working either. I'm going to try the streamer. Bertrand just caught another fish, his second one. He tells me there are some good holes around, we're going to try those. They're biting here. It put up a good fight. It's my first time fishing with a streamer. I tried earlier with a fly and caught one. Bertrand showed me the spot and I made three casts with the streamer. We give it a little shake, giving small jerks as if the fish were moving in different directions. I knew it was well hooked. It arrived tired, that's why it didn't struggle too much. It was tired, and that's what needed to be done, playing with it, taking my time. It has a beautiful gray coloration. We've been fishing with Pascal for an hour and a half. We've almost reached our quota. I have three, and Pascal has two. Don't speak too soon. Yes, I almost lost one. For the last catches of the day, we decide to go to the base of the waterfall. The fish can no longer swim upstream beyond that point, so they gather there to spawn in the numerous pools. Fishing in this enchanting setting is a unique experience especially when the fish are biting.
For me, it's the third catch of the day. Bertrand alternates between fly, streamer, and spoon until he makes this catch, a beautiful 3kg arctic charm. How did you catch it? In the same spot. Exactly in the same spot. Just after we left, with a small spoon. We'll stop here. And we can just say that for this first day at Ibiuta, it has been a magnificent day. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but today was truly fantastic. Seven beautiful fish between the two of us is more than enough, at least for the next two days. We return to Ipiutak. As the day comes to an end after fishing, it's time for gathering. Here, during the three or four weeks of summer, numerous wild aromatic plants grow. Agath invites us to accompany her to explore her natural herb garden. We don't have to go far to discover these astonishing Greenlandic scents with her. This is the famous Greenlandic thyme. I think it's called Arctic thyme. Is it comparable to the thyme we similar, know in France? but still quite different. It's already very fragrant. Does it taste like our thyme? I wouldn't say so, but it has a hint of violet flavor. We should encourage people to eat thyme like this because it has a unique flavor that we don't really know. Just alongside other more familiar flavors, but with a more pronounced taste. I also make sorrel soup with potatoes. It's similar to spinach. Well, you know sorrel, we grow it in gardens, but here, it's wild. There's plenty of it because the soil is very acidic. Here we also find Campanula repunculoids, delicious in salads or as a condiment. There are pink stone crops that can withstand temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius, they are mainly used for medicinal purposes. And then there's the queen plant of the Greenlandic summer, Angelica, which can also be found in our regions. Angelica, I didn't know much about it. In France, we know it in candied form, and it's a specialty of the Poitevin Marsh. So, I did some research. Angelica was imported, it's truly a Nordic plant. It was imported to France in the 12th century from Scandinavian countries, and in the Middle Ages, it became a miracle plant because apparently, it has incredible medicinal properties in its leaves, stems, and roots. From the 18th century onward, a lot of work was done on Angelica in France, more in confectionery and liqueurs. We're more familiar with it in sweet form. Here, you just have to bend down and help yourself. This is delicious. It has a slight hazelnut flavor. I'll put it in the salad. We eat the seeds when they start to mature, before they fall off, just the seeds. The seeds of the alpine bistort, a plant species found in high mountains and arctic regions. For dinner, we'll simply add some arctic thyme to our arctic char fillets, a taste that can only be found here. The next day, when we head out for fishing, we're not alone. Hina, Agath's daughter, and Etienne, a young French agronomist doing an internship on the farm, are with us. And if they're joining us, there's a good reason for it. Apparently, tonight or tomorrow, there will be a Buya base, and Hina is on a mission. What's your mission? To catch the trout. What will you be fishing with today? What do you have to show us? I don't have any experience with the spoon or the fly. On the farm, local fishermen mainly use the spoon, a faster technique for catching fish that they need for sustenance. You have to follow her. She doesn't know all the paths, but she's fast. She doesn't know all the paths because she never ventures far from home. I don't like being alone, far up in the mountains. There can be dangerous things. Sometimes, eagles attack when they see that we're in trouble. You never know if there could be polar bears around. 
a little girl in the mountains shouldn't wander alone, right? It's funny because she's both very comfortable here, but there's also a slightly fearful side. She's a unique little girl who lives in a different world, but she's very resourceful. She catches her own fish and brings them back to her mother. The fishing spot chosen by Hina is about 50 meters downstream from the large waterfall. It's apparently one of the most fish-filled areas of the river. Here, it's called the pool. So, are there any fish? It's teeming with fish. Is that so? That's incredible. There are even more than last time. In the pool, there are hundreds of Arctic char. Perhaps even thousands. The females come here to lay their eggs. The site in this spawning zone is very impressive. In less than five minutes, Hina catches one. How can you tell it's a female? The males have a kind of protruding beak. But the arctic char are now wary, and they're not here to feed. It's going to take much longer to catch another one. Minutes pass, and still nothing. And it's finally Etienne, after half an hour of patience, who manages to hook one. A nice catch. A second one, well done. How many fish did mom order? Two or three. There are two, so that's good enough, right? Yes. You going back home? Yes. See you later. It's been a good 30 minutes since they stopped fighting, but we'll still try fishing with Bertrand, but not with the spoon. We'll try nymph fishing. Before picking up his rod again, Pascal decides to capture some underwater footage an opportunity to witness an exceptional aquatic ballet. At the same time, Bertrand positions himself on the rock overlooking the pool, and it works, but the length of the line, which risks breaking, and the apparent weight of the fish make it challenging to reel in. Take it easy. Slowly, bring it towards me. It's going to be a joint effort because there's depth here. I'm trying, but I'm struggling. It has a sublime coat. Magnificent. The fish was caught from below. Bertrand hooked it without it being able to bite. Now it's Pascal's turn, but the fly is no longer working, so he tries with a nymph. Good decision. What works is the nymph. I stopped using the streamer. We hooked the fish. And it bit. It's a more interesting type of fishing. We move downstream, and as soon as we see a small waterfall followed by calm water, we let the nymph glide. And I'm very happy because it bit well like that. Just the nymph like that? The one you made yourself? Yes. The nymph is funny because you made it yourself. Initially, it's not a nymph, it's a fly, and you removed its wings, turning it into a sort of nymph. 
Specialists will laugh, but it actually works. Right here. Look what you just caught. Later in the afternoon, we decide to return to the pool, the large water reservoir where Arctic char come to spawn. And to our surprise, we come across Michel, a Swiss, and Francois, a Frenchman. They both made the long journey here for a genuine reason. We came here because it was probably the best place in the world to fish for Arctic char. There aren't many places on Earth where you can fish for them in rivers like this. It's a highly combative salmonid, worth as much as salmon. Just like salmon, the Arctic char is a migratory species, but also a formidable predator. For anglers, no matter where they come from, it's one of the most sought after river fish. In the late afternoon, by the fjord, we meet Agath and Hina, who has put on her not happy monkey mask. The fish need to be gutted, and while the smell may attract dogs, it doesn't amuse Hina much. But tonight, several guests, including us, are expected. The mother and daughter start filleting the fish because there's a dinner to prepare. On the menu, Arctic char as an appetizer, which will also serve as the base for the main course. The highly anticipated Greenlandic Booyah base. It's nearly 8 p.m., and we're at Agat's place, putting the finishing touches on a dinner that promises to be rich in flavors. It's a gourmet meal exclusively prepared with local ingredients. Outside, there are five guests, all fishermen, plus us, making a total of seven. Agath enjoys hosting and pays great attention to detail. Here are our hosts. Michel is one of our fishing friends. We met here and became friends instantly. Francois as well, when we met here, we're also expecting Norwegians, fellow fishermen. What's your name? Per. You're from Norway. Is it your first day of fishing? Yes, it's my first day of fishing. At the table, there's also another Michel, a Franco-Swiss, and Harry, the second Norwegian fisherman. It's an Arctic char prepared in the style of gravad. You're familiar with it, of course. And the plant is called rosewood in English, rosenwading in Danish, and de lafpur in French. There's a bit of spice with alcohol. Enjoy your meal. Thank you. We're eagerly looking forward to tasting it and with desire. It's truly delicious. Because it's... One might think it's smoked fish, but not at all. It's preserved, yet all the taste and flavors come through. It's a delight. I love it. We need to learn how to make this. Finally, here's the dish everyone has been waiting for, the Greenlandic Booyah base, with a subtle touch of wild thyme. A dish with a delicate aroma that will be unanimously enjoyed. Agath, do you add Rui? No, I don't make Rui, but we could. There's already plenty of garlic. It has the color and taste of Buya base, with an extra touch of the Arctic. And since the Arctic is honored tonight, we conclude the dinner with this sweet treat flavored with Angelica. A typical Greenlandic cake. Even the flour is edible. Is it good? Yes. 
The next morning, under a beautiful sun, we begin our last day of fishing in Ipiutak. A day that will bring us some pleasant surprises. In the meantime, we decide to go down the river, which flows into the lake. Bertrand, we're reaching the end of the lake, the end of the world. Yes, there's the river after running for about four or five kilometers a good through the valley. Walk. It flows into this lake, which is connected to the fjord, so normally the fish there shouldn't be there because they've gone upstream. Around. We'll give it a try, and even if we don't catch anything, the scenery is so magnificent that it was worth the walk. And this morning? We won't catch anything either near the lake or further up the river. But it doesn't matter. Under the sun, the river reveals its transparency and colors. And yes, we made the right choice walking all the way there. Towards the end of the morning, we decide to try a different fishing technique, further upstream, in one of those miraculous holes we just spotted. In Greenland, hand fishing is practiced in certain rivers, it's an old tradition. But the hole is too deep, so we'll try our luck with a net. It's not hand fishing, but net fishing. It's a first here. Look, I went down very slowly. Usually, as soon as I take half a step, the fish swim away. They flee like that. I put the net in the water, and at one point, suddenly, I lifted it. Look how magnificent it is. As magnificent as they are, these easily caught fish will be released back into the river, one by one. Pascal tries to go even deeper. But it's really deep. For him too, on the first netting attempt, within seconds a magnificent arctic char. <laughs> we'll release it. It's truly a fishing method that allows us to be mosquito repellent. After this interlude with the net, we return to fly fishing, and we find Michel, our fishing friend, focused at his spot. The goal of this three-way fishing is our lunch, and it doesn't take long for the fish to bite. Twenty minutes later, the freshly caught fish is already being filleted. The fillets are simply placed on a rock and marinated with a little lemon juice and olive oil, with a hint of wild thyme. Michel, as an experienced fisherman, do you enjoy this kind of ritual? I love this ritual. Even as a fisherman, I appreciate it when it's prepared by others. Last lunch by the Ilya River. Tonight, we return to France with a taste of this place that will linger with us for a long time. And the music that keeps playing in our minds without end. <laughs>